join Nikki, a spiritual advisor and divine gifted healer, as she unlocks the secrets to living a joyful, aligned life. Discover how her unique abilities as a dream walker, astral traveler, and psychic medium can provide clarity and connection, guiding you towards your soul's true path. Welcome to the Happiness on Tap podcast, where guests dive deep into the vulnerable experiences that contribute to their happiness. I'm Leanne Heron, certified life and health coach, owner of Finding Resilience with Leanne, and host of this podcast. This episode is part of our health and wellness series. Today, I am talking with Nikki Burton Phillips. Nikki is currently residing in Albuquerque, New Mexico with her divinely gifted family. She is a spiritual advisor, mother, multi-ethnic cultural author, CEO, and co-founder of the Connected Compass Limited Company. Nikki is devoted to living life in the silliest, authentically aligned, and most joyful and harmonious way possible. After decades of putting her wisdom and divine gifts to work for family and friends, she decided to answer her deepest calling by aligning with and walking her soul's path to help others. By utilizing her spiritual gifts and life wisdom, she can discover what is hidden to provide the clarity and connection for those that sit with her. And as if that wasn't enough, she is also a certified sacred empowerment coach and one of only two in the world. She wrought, right? Certified facilitator? She wrote, but yeah, yeah. Wrote? She wrote. It's funny because in, in the cards, there is a she wrought card. Oh, okay. So thank you for joining us for the joyful soul, embracing authenticity the spiritual alignment. Hello, Nikki. Thank you so much for joining me. How are you today? Good, good, great, magically amazing as always. As always. I, you know, even on bad days, I have to put that out there because it just shifts things for me right away. So (sighs) I'm always magically amazing. How are you? I am wonderful today. Yay. So let's get started. Okay. Nikki, can you tell us just a little bit about what you do and how people can benefit from coming to you for your services? So I developed a method called the Strategic Intuitive Guidance Method. And it was during a time when I was training as a life coach. And a sacred empowerment coach, I was kind of doing all of these things, but I realized that coaching limited me with my gifts and my gifts kept pushing through. So um, I came up with this beautiful method of putting it all together and how it benefits people is I see so many things. Um whether it be past lives, their um, first incarnation, whether it be loved ones on the other side, guides, what have you, connecting all of those pieces for them. So it's really a holistic approach to helping people discover where they're really unaligned because when you're aligned in your life then things just flow it's not like it's you know perfect and you're not going to have bumps in the road but it's really about shifting fear spaces and having that that clarity to move forward and a lot of people as you know as a coach get stuck Mm -hmm. in a space and 
you know, you're trying to help them move forward and elicit those, um, you know, you somehow you can ask the questions that either they've asked themselves and they don't answer or they're afraid to ask themselves. Um, the nice thing about being psychic is that when I do connect, I can see other pieces that are really blocking that space for them. Mm -hmm. or, um, and even guide them to other coaches, other resources. So that's, that's how they benefit from working with me. I connect them to either old spaces. Sometimes it's spirit inner child work that needs to happen. Um, or just connecting with a, a past life or past incarnation to bring that strength forward, to remind them of, to turn that piece of them on, to remind them of who they are so that they are empowered to move forward. Mm, I absolutely love it. And it's definitely also for me, what I love about being a coach is that connection to maybe something that they're not realizing is a true block for them. And being able to crack that door in a way that they choose to walk through it and face it. Um, and so your added level of what you see that they don't even bring to the table um, helps give you that extra level of touch with someone. Yeah, definitely. And it, it, it helps. Because another thing that part of my gifts is I can often at times, I don't always like to do it, but I can put myself in that space with that person. So I can sit there and see through their eyes, feel what they were feeling in those moments where those blocks came in so that it's like, oh, sometimes I feel it. You know, I can feel where they're holding it in their body. I can feel where it's in their head or it's in their heart or, and then it's like, oh, well, this is why that wasn't working because you're still in this, this space. You put yourself kind of locked in this box over here. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it is, it's, it's always interesting. And like I said, I, I the coach piece, I am always just grateful for coaches and in awe of coaches because all of you do something that is very unique and you really, I am not a space holder. You guys are like, you guys are really good at that. <laughs> I, I am not, <laughs> that is, I am not, I'm like, no, I had a friend who told me one time, she was like, you just kind of bull do bulldoze through problems sometimes you know that right and I'm like that's great too that's what you got to do and but coaches are always very patient I've noticed like really good coaches are very patient so I'm always grateful for you guys because then I can just oh here's that block let me clear that and then you can go work with this coach and you can go work with Leanne and you can go you know so it that's another way that I help people is I, I help connect them to resources um, because I, I believe in a collaborative and team effort. There's our, there's one of our many connections. <laughs> yes. <laughs> because that is really um, probably my strongest draw to my coaching practice is knowing that I may not be for everybody. Um, or that they may need something that is not in my wheelhouse, but that I can refer them based on my personal experiences in working with this person. Um, in fact, I did that yesterday um, with a lady and referred her to hypnotherapy. And, you know, they tell us not to share our stories, but then I feel like, how am I gonna truly connect and refer someone if I don't share my story, my experience, why I tried this and the, the, the changes that it had in my life as a whole. 
Um, and, you know, and I started recently working with a coach and being coached. And like you said, sometimes it's that, um, you know, having somebody else help me hone in on what I'm not listening to about myself, even though I know how to do it for somebody else. She'll stop me and be like, okay, so where in your body are you feeling that? <laughs> mm -hmm. where, where, where are you holding that? Where is that? And that's something else I see too, is I see in people, I get those messages cha channeled through of here's kind of where we were trying to guide them to, or here's their greater purpose or here's, and they're just kind of a lot of times people are on track with their purpose. It's just, they're not trusting it. And they're not listening to their own. Everybody has guides and has something behind them that is helping them and guide them. And, but they can't always hear them. They're not always sure if that, if they're going crazy. Um, so sometimes another thing that I help people with is I'm like, oh, you have your own abilities. I don't know how many times I have people sit in front of me and I'm like, why are you sitting in front of me? you you have your own gifts and sometimes I'm like they they're either going to be larger than mine if you really hone in on them or they're I'm in awe of them mm -hmm. um and everybody's gifts are different yeah you can learn certain things but really they're just as unique as a fingerprint a snowflake like everyone's is different. So I, that's something that I love seeing in people is their own intuitive or psychic gifts or what they came in with that maybe they su got suppressed um, and helping to open that up. Because sometimes when you just open that part up, it's like, oh, okay. Yeah. I can move through this. And now I know exactly what I want to do. And I know what I'm in love with. And I know what my passion is. Mm -hmm. That is and always. I'm... Go ahead. That's always the hard one for me is when someone, when someone sits in front of me and they don't even know, you know, they truly don't know what they're passionate about. It It's my heart aches for them because I'm like, oh my gosh. Okay. And that can be worked through too. That discovery process, but yeah, to not have at least an inkling is always like, oof, oof. So allowing them to have a voice to explore that is another um, space. So I create a sacred safe space for that exploration too. Absolutely. And I want to go into that further because it's going to really lead into the next question that I have for you. I know the answer, but it's something that it, it really plays into what we were just talking about is how your journey uh, led you to em embrace your gifts to become a spiritual advisor. Ooh, that's a big one. Um, <laughs> I'm like, you, you know, but okay. Um, you know, I, I was born this way. And when I recently got asked by somebody, they were like, well, how long have you been a psychic medium? And I'm like, I'm going to be 46 in March. So almost 46 years of my life. Like I was born this way. Um, recognizably for like verbalization and confirmation outside of me. I was probably one and a half, two years old. Um, healing, I was an infant. So all of those pieces, you know, I, as a kid, I was very overwhelmed. And then I didn't want to be weird and I didn't want, and I'm neurodivergent, which that wasn't even like on the radar when I was a kid, you know, most Gen Xers, well, if you weren't good in this area at school, or you didn't like this particular thing, or you didn't, then you were just 
lazy or you were kind of that outcast. You were different. I didn't, I didn't want to be weird, you know. Um, so I I hit a lot of it. School, social settings, everything was loud for me. I could see everybody's people, you know, on the other side. I could. So when you're sitting in a class with like 30 kids. That's a full room. Yeah, it's a very compressed, tight, oppressive room. Um, and yeah, I just, I focused so much of my life on trying to suppress that, be normal. And then when I had my own kids, it was like dealing with all of the trauma that I had gone through as a child because your kids kind of trigger a lot of that, right? Like I have never been one who has been able to forget traumatic experiences or anything like, like those are right there all the time. And when my kids came along, I, I was like, okay, I know that I have a responsibility to figure this shit out. And when my first marriage fell apart, it was like I started the journey. And um, I dipped into some areas of lifestyles and things that I found I was really good at holding and not so much holding, but creating a sacred space. And I liked that. But then I got into another relationship that, again, I made myself small for. And did all the things that I thought. It's interesting how when you, you go through one marriage and then you have another. Um, you do all the things that would have fixed the first marriage, right? Right. Mm -hmm. on your end of things in the second one but the second one is totally different and it doesn't fix things over there and when that fell apart and I was just at rock bottom just was at my bottom and this is coming from someone who's been an addict and was, I was teetering on my sobriety at that point with that bottom. And I was like, oh, hell no. That is the one thing under my belt that I am sure of. And I'm not going to give up for anybody ever. And suddenly it was like, I had been doing stuff all my life that fit everyone else's narrative. That was everybody else's story of me. That was everybody, um, you know, what their expectation was and failing at their expectations most of the time because none of them fit me. And I was sitting in an office of a friend who I absolutely adore. And really, she asked the question that, in a way sparked and was that like that jump off point for me she asked you know she asked me she was we were going through a business plan for my first business my first company which was social media and it was around election time and I was just so sick of it I was managing everybody's stuff I was you know, I had finally landed a big project. And unfortunately, that was with my, at that time, I was separated from my um, soon to be ex husband, I was separated from him. And but that big project was with the company he worked for. So I still had to see him mm -hmm. on occasion. And as I was glowing and leveling up in this, he took notice, but it was this weird thing, right? Anyways, 
This friend asked me as she's going through a business plan with me, she said, you know, does all of this make sense? And she's running numbers and like how much I need to do to live on my own, to survive because he had been the primary um, breadwinner, which was out of touch for me. And I didn't realize until that moment how far I had gone away from myself. But she asked, she said, what the, she's like, does this all make sense? And I said, yeah, it makes sense. It's just not something I want. She's like, well, why did you start it? I said for that person, mm -hmm. because they needed me to be working. It wasn't enough for them that I was doing all these other things. They, they wanted me to have a job and to be working. And I was trying to fit that somehow. Um, and she said, what the fuck do you want? And no one had ever asked me that. I think we all My need to ask that question a lot more often. Mm-hmm. And you should be, you should be asking yourself that question every day. I do still. Every morning I check in, if I am out of alignment, if I am noticing that I am kind of off, I ask what I want that day. What I need, what I want. Um, but yeah, in that moment, I was like, I don't know. And she said, what the fuck does Nikki want? And I just sat there for a minute. And she started asking me, you know, the questions, what gets you up in the morning? What's your why? Why are you? And everything at that point centered, centered around my kids. And then I started taking this exploration of myself though, and really embracing my gifts. I didn't want to hide from myself anymore. I didn't want to check out for myself anymore. I started realizing that the more I tried to suppress them or shut them out, the louder they got, the worse I felt, the sicker I felt, the more exhausted I felt. Um, and it was like, they're always there. It's, it doesn't matter. It never mattered how hard I tried to suppress them. They were always there. So it was really about, okay, let's own this and let's figure out how I can do this. Step into this and do this fully. And then it was like one thing after another, a lot of letting go of things. Um, to create that space, but man, I love what I do now. Like that, that saying, you know, if you do what you love, you're never going to work a day in your life. I, I don't like, yeah, there, there's work on the back end, right? Of owning your own business. But even that, I can sit there in those moments and I'm like, yep, but this gets me to what I really like to do. And I get to go do that. And I get to be me. I get to show up as me. Um, and that is, there is a freedom in that, that I can't even describe. And I have sat back and apologized to my younger self at points. And I'm like, I'm so sorry that I didn't mm -hmm. honor you, even in the moments when you really tried to break into your authenticity and someone tried to shut that down or you allowed someone to shut that down or you shut it down. Like it, it's been, a, it's been, I've shifted from journey to adventure now. So that's, yeah. Embracing my gifts was something that I needed because it saved, it was going to save my life. That was the other piece was I was dying. Like I just, I didn't want to live. 
And then I got to a point where, okay, I'll live my life for my kids. But that's not going to sustain you either because kids grow, they get their own lives, their own, you know. And once I embraced me and really started exploring me and what I wanted and remembering times that I, I would step into that, it was like, oh, wow. I really fucking love me. Like, I love me. And that right there is a whole other ball game. That opens so much up. And then I get phenomenal women that come into my life like you that I'm like, oh, shit. These were the friends that I would sit around and I'm like, why am I hanging out with these and not all of my friends. So for those that are listening that I grew up with, not all of you were shady, but y'all know we had some <laughs> shady ass people around us that I would sit around and we would sit around and go, why? Why are we all here with this person? It, this one, wow, why are we here? And then you feel like the dumbass because you're sitting there with this person and you're like, why am I here? But yet I'm here. <laughs> you literally wrapped my entire life up in one answer <laughs> every word I'm like writing it down over here trying not to laugh out loud while you're talking and acknowledging all the things that are like okay 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 um I don't know if you caught my post this morning about um obligation versus intention I did. I did. That was um, very on point with what you were talking about. That first phase or, you know, season of my life where it was all about my kids having the right job so that I could provide benefits and have a roof over their head and, and all of those things. And now getting to be in this season of my life where it's completely different. My kids are grown. As you said, kids grow and leave the house and, and you get to fall in love with yourself. At the same time, you're thinking back, oh, okay. Like I didn't allow her to come out. I didn't look inward to see her you know, trying to get my attention because I wasn't supposed to at that time. Um, and now, you know, and being able to let go um, and accept and love myself. Um, <laughs> you really just like one thing after another, I was like, oh my goodness. <laughs> That's why I love these conversations we have. <laughs> even when you're talking, I sit there, I'm like, check, check, check. Thank you for reflecting that. And now reflecting the positive, check, check. That's absolutely, absolutely. And that's how you know you're, that's another way you know you're in alignment is when the people around you, you can sit there and it's no longer a trauma dump trauma bonding thing it's a really like here's where I was and yeah this happened to me what? and instead of staying there <laughs> right now it and here's where I am and you can reflect that oh yeah that's where we are now we're over here yeah isn't it great being over here isn't it great feeling this and what about this and like that's, that's the space that really like when I do, when I need to, to check in with myself or, and maybe I'm just having a day or a moment where eh, I'm, I'm kind of avoiding myself. I know I can go to my circle, my people and have that little moment of and if you guys don't have coach friends you need to get some life coach friends because let me tell you <laughs> some of them will bring the most reflective stuff to you and then pose something that sometimes we're even afraid to be I think 
especially if you're in our generation, because we were taught to just live and find comfort in the trauma mm -hmm. and suck it up. Like last night, I think I even told a friend, I was like, suck it up, buttercup. And they laughed at me and I was like, oh yeah. Mm. I remember that comment. <laughs> oh, okay. But that, that piece there of, yeah, we get so stuck in that. So having friends who are coaches that, you know, I've got a friend who is a hope coach. Hmm. And she is a badass at it. Like, God, she is sunshine. But she does not come without her share of trauma. And sure. none of us do. Yeah. And so she goes, you know, she she elicits the questions because I think, like I was saying, we come accustomed to to living in that trauma space and that comfort, she asks the questions that are the good stuff too, where we're really afraid to go. I've noticed that like when I'm with old friends versus newer friends who old friends who haven't dealt with their stuff fully or they're, you know, they're still on the, we'll use something else to cope. Mm -hmm. And I sit with them and I'm like, oh, wow. And when I ask them a good stuff kind of question or they can't even like shifting into that space is so foreign and so uncomfortable that it is like sometimes physically painful to watch. And I'm like, oh, wow, that's really, I'm, oh. Oh, and I can remember being there mm -hmm. like that. The other shoe's going to drop. Why do I even get that? Why do I, why do I? Oh, no, 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 no. I don't even know. I love no. I love the word no. It is a complete sentence. And sometimes I tell myself no. I I love being able to tell other people no. And I didn't used to like, oh. especially again, if you're a Gen X or you were raised not to say no. And if your kids said no, oh my gosh, can you remember first word that a child really says confidently and firmly is no. Mm -hmm. And we go to punishing them and breaking them because that is what we were taught. Mm -hmm. you were immediately punished if you said no mm -hmm. um wow hadn't really thought much about that thank you Nikki <laughs> you're welcome and that's part of but that you know you reminded me of that when I read your post this morning about the intentional like having intention and I I was like there's a step further to that and then you wrapped it up in the end. And I was like, yes, actionable intention. You have to take action. There are plenty of people who sit around and manifest. They write their things. They write their intentions. They, you know, but you have to be willing to take action on it. And that's where people get stuck. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the action you have to take is no. There's a lot of yeses after that no. I will tell you that. But sometimes you have to do the initial no. And that can be one of the hardest spaces because often at times it's people that no longer align with us. It's things that there are comfort zone, but comfort doesn't equal happy. No. I'm like... It doesn't. You, and you can die comfortably. But I can promise you it's going to be a slow and painful and agonizing death. Absolutely. And you brought up something else earlier when you first were answering this question 
about kind of being able to face the no and being okay with the no, regardless of the outcome. And, and it's tough. It's, you know, um, as women, um, as people, I think in general, not just women, but women more than men, I think, um, we really struggle with setting boundaries and sticking to our guns um, until the worst or the inevitable happens and you feel like you almost punish yourself for having that boundary and you're no longer, you feel like you're no longer in control to be able to work through that boundary with the person you set because they're no longer with us. And it has taken me a while to learn that that's still okay um, to live and acknowledge that I set a boundary um, and that I can't go back to that person um, and work through why I set that boundary because it really doesn't matter anymore. Um, it matters the why I did it in the first place and giving myself grace that I did it. You know, there's a step for it, another step in that, in boundary setting. So um, when I'm working with clients and I even ask my own kids and family, you know, when they're right now, my son is working on that, setting boundaries. And that's something, you know, that not living my authentic self did is it taught my kids not to live their authentic self, even though I was sitting there cheering them on and, you know, what do we got to do? What do we, it allowed them enough of that space, but not fully. Um, so now it's kind of like, as I live my authentic self, they're starting to see that more, but even in setting boundaries, like I come from a family that boundaries aren't a thing like it mm -hmm. they're just not a thing um the more that you know you explore and dive deep into them but I realized something my boundaries I can always stand firm on them and boundaries are flexible sometimes that's the other thing about boundaries they're not a wall they're not your boundaries are for you and just because someone else doesn't honor them, you have the choice in that moment to, in those moments, it's about you holding that boundary for yourself. If your boundaries align with your core values, then it, it's really, it's easier in a lot of ways. And it's easy to let go in those moments of, I'm never going to be able to, you know, talk to that person again. And how do I reconcile that? Well, look at your core, look at what your core values, what, because that's where your alignment is too. Um, why did you set that boundary? You know, does it go with your core beliefs? Well, then eventually down the road somewhere, that's the other thing. Something's going to be removed at some point. It's just how bad is it going to get? You know, people stay in marriages and in situations for years and years and years. And You'll, you'll set boundary after boundary, right? And then you're like, oh, but you know, this and that, and you, you negotiate it with yourself. When you start to find out what your core values are, it becomes real hard to negotiate with yourself on those. And you can even go back and look at like points in your childhood where stuff didn't set well with you. And yet you, you negotiated then you were either forced to negotiate or you, you did for the sake of whatever at that point, but 
yeah, there are some things that like, I look back and I'm like, oof, oof. So that boundary piece, and that's what I live by. I live by hard and fast. If it takes me out of my peace, if it takes me out of my harmony, if it steals from my joy, if it takes me, you know, and that can be my own thoughts, my own feelings, my own, if it takes me out of those spaces. It better be a damn good reason why it's taking me out of those spaces. And really there shouldn't be one. I, I Since I have connected with those and really lived my authentic self and embraced that, those things do come up, but it's like, then that's not aligning with me anymore. And it's not meant for me. And sometimes it's really hard and it's heartbreaking. I mean, I've had to let go of people that I never thought I would have to let go of or distance myself from or, you know, but everybody has their path. Mm -hmm. So that's just my take on boundaries. <laughs> well, that's okay, because we're going to take your take on boundaries and my take on boundaries, and that is going to be our next class together. Ooh. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> it, it It is exactly what I think a lot of people need help and guidance um, to learn how to do that. You know, I didn't have somebody to teach me how to have boundaries. And so if you and I can be that guide to help somebody else learn what that means, learn how to do it, learn how to live into your core values, even learn what your core values are. Because a lot of our core values may be our identity or our beliefs, but they weren't truly our beliefs or our identity. It was what was forced upon us through our upbringing that has been a generational pass down. And now we are in this beautiful phase of life where we have the power to break that chain. Um, so yeah, this is what you and I are going to be doing. All right. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm with it. I am all about it. I'm like, I am for it because that is a big piece, you know? And when you said that, it reminded me of a while back, I had posted something about my values. I think around just after Christmas and the new year, I had gotten a, a lot of times I'll get these like divine guided messages that channel through. And so I'll just post them up on Facebook or Instagram, sometimes TikTok. Um, but I had posted something about core values and I had put mine down and my mom commented and said, well, what about this and this? And it was something about, oh, what about love? Because it wasn't in there. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, because a lot of times when people think about love, as their core value. They think of love as an extension of themselves or outside of themselves. And when I came home to myself and realized, you know, going through and um, looking at what do I need? What do I need? You know, and realizing, oh shit, I love the hell out of myself, right? So what am I missing? And at that point it was peace. And then I realized like I had a physical reaction to not having peace in my life, to not being able to feel my own peace, to create my own peace. Um, I have a friend who We've been friends since we were little kids and, you know, coincidentally is a male. And the first time I saw him, 
he had won the coolest ancestors around him. And, you know, but you can't run up to a, a nine-year-old and say, hey, I see, you know, um, but he had this peace and he still does even after everything he has gone through and been through war, um, you know, growing up like we did, um, cancer, part of his brain missing, like all of those things, but yet he is still the most calm and peaceful person. I can, all I have to do is hear his voice. And it is like, I'm in that state. But here's the problem with that. It was outside of me. That is outside of me. I need to be able to create that for myself inside of me. Otherwise, I'm going to keep running around and finding messes that, yeah, for five minutes. And what does peace look like for me? Because it's not the same for me as it is for someone else. Oh. So I had to have that talk with my mom. She's like, well, love, you know, family. And I'm like, <laughs> what you say is family, I say are relatives. Family is a choice. Blood relation is not. DNA is not. Family, friends, love are all choices and actions. Um, half the time people don't even know what love is. It's defined by what we see, what we, you know, they don't even really know what they're feeling. They think it's the chemistry, it's the butterflies, it's the, you know, which are all now as we're all learning red flags for crap. And we're like, yep. well, shit, the love bombing, the, all of that was stuff that I'm sorry. I wanted the Jake Ryan from 16 count I want I even dated a guy who had a Porsche and I loved that Porsche and I wanted him I was helping him work on that Porsche just so he could pull up and I could have the 16 candles moment and the Jake Ryan moment and the <laughs> what you really want is you want the ducky right as women you want the guy on pretty and pink ducky who's your best friend that's always the there loyal, the, mm -hmm. It shows up and he even loves you so much that he looks at you and says, your dude didn't show up with anybody else. Go get him. Like that's who we want, but you have to be able to be that for yourself. So yeah, anytime I'm not that for myself, I'm like, all right, girl, we got to have little sit down and that's when I, I sit with myself for a while or I treat myself to something to reconnect with myself to make sure I'm in alignment with my values what's going on so I don't know what tangent <laughs> I got off on there that's I okay that obvious that tangent was meant to come out for a reason because here's something I have not shared with you um, in our <laughs> many conversations my son's birth name is Jake Ryan. <laughs> Just one of those things. How did that never come up? Like I, the Jake, what's weird is, is you did. Okay. So yeah, the other day you said Jake and it popped in my head. Oh, Jake Ryan. And I just kind of went on because we were talking about something else. Huh. That is my son's name. <laughs> so there we go. There we go. It's it's gonna be. <laughs> oh, it's a day. It's gonna be a day. Okay. So let's talk about what it means to live into the silliest, authentically aligned, most joyful and harmonious way possible. So first, it's the silly. If you look up the definition and look up the original definition of 
the word silly. It is prosperous. It is joyful. It is, it's all of it, right? So as long as I am silly and I love, I used to get offended by that. I had a mother-in-law who one day, she said, you know, I just don't, I'm never going to think anyone's good enough for my kids. And you're just, you know, you're kind of dingy and you're kind of silly, which I had never been called in my life. I've been called silly off and on by various boyfriends or whatever, but never dingy. So then when the two came together, I was like, so I never, I would cringe. Mm -hmm. Then I was at a workshop with one of my mentors and we were pulling tarot cards as a matter of fact. And I got the fool. And she said, you know, the best part about being the fool is that you can be silly. And she guided me. She said, I want you to look up the word silly. And when I looked it up and I looked up the origin, the original, I was like, I will be the fool every damn day then. Because that shit right there gets you everything you want in life. They are happy. They are joyful. They are and just because you look like the fool does not mean you are the fool. Mm -hmm. um, people are going to think what they're going to think. They're going to write their version of you yep. regardless. If someone is hell-bent on not liking you or trashing you or whatever, they're going to do it for whatever reason. So silly allowed me the space to start to move into that aligned, that authentic self to not give a shit anymore what everybody else thought or wanted or, um, yeah. And so it means to me, one, those, all those words mean to me to live my core values. joyful. I, once you experience joy, true joy, or you can reflect back and remember that joy. I'm a, I'm a recovering addict. I tell people all the time, you know, every addict looks at it differently. Just because I have that, well, we're going on 26, 27 years almost of sobriety from or abstinence from my drug of choice. Um, doesn't mean that my addictive behaviors go away. Mm -hmm. So it's like, and I look around and I see people all the time that I'm like, you're an addict, you're an addict. You just don't want to admit you're an addict or you don't even recognize what you're doing is an addiction. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so I'm like, what do I want to be addicted to then? I want to be addicted to my joy. Because that maintains my sobriety. That maintains my alignment. That takes me out of when it's a bad day or a bad moment. I can look at it and go, it's a moment. Mm -hmm. And I can start to pull from, I tell people, you know, you have banks. If you look at your brain, like it's banks, a banking system, because everybody, you know, especially right now with the economy is fixated on money and how do we make money and money? And I'm like, okay, you keep pulling from your trauma bank. You keep pulling from the and you keep depositing in that shit too. Every time you pull out, you put back in sometimes exactly what you withdrew or 10 times worse. What is your bank account? Think of your, so think of that as your checking account and think of your joy 
you you've reversed them basically. Your joy should be your checking where you're constantly getting that return where you're drawing funds from. Your trauma should be like well should be kind of like a a you know I don't know a safe deposit box something that you know is kind of there that you can fall back on to reflect and it should only be there to remind you that okay this is the pattern and this takes from our joy and so we don't want to mess with that but instead we all tend to draw from and feed that trauma one instead of the joy so for me it really is it's about reflecting on all my joyful moments Because you're going to have love, you're going to have pain, you're going to have heartache, you're going to have happiness, you're going to have joy in your life. They're all going to be there and they're there to help you, one, get through one, the other, to be appreciative and grateful for the other. So, you know, there's a reason why I love the fact that Part of my ethnic background is I'm Irish and we have wakes. Because at those wakes, yeah, when we're all sitting there and, re you know, remembering that person, we go back to the joy that we share. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we go through the stupid moments, but in those stupid moments that we did really dumb shit, there was a joy there, right? There was a laughter, like... Mm -hmm. Um, and we can touch on the, the bad stuff, but look, what, what does that get us? And we bounce right back to the joy moments. And so it's like, that's why you have joy for the times when you have to let go, when there is loss. Um, so I do, I, I, I am super mindful of that. I am protective of it. And it also means that I reflect that to my kids so that they can hopefully call that into their lives and bring that in. Because being a young mom and my kids were along for the shit show ride. Yeah. And lived a lot of it and they have their own trauma and stuff now that they're working through. And I am not one of those parents who's like, ah, that's theirs to deal with. No, I helped create a lot of that shit. I helped bring it in. I own it. And we have hard conversations around it. And they aren't always fun. And it's sad to me when they can't pull a joyful moment. And then it's like, but I can so if I can't give my kid money today, I can pull a joyful moment and give them that and hopefully spark that. Um, harmon harmonious, you know, yes, my peace is for myself, but I don't ever stress to have peace to me. Always reminds me of like walking around a library or an art museum, or, you know, something where you have to be quiet, and you have to just reflect, and sit, and be centered, and enjoy, and you have to, nature is not peaceful. Birds nature... are chirping, and mm -hmm. <laughs> the wind when... is blowing through the trees, and yeah, but it, and there is life and death happening 24-7 in nature, all the time. And so it's really about being in harmony for me. When nature is in harmony and it's not even balanced because balance, I think it's a falsehood. A lot of times and we get too caught up and that's how we feed the perfectionist in us. A lot of times we switch the perfectionist for someone seeking balance, but it's really just another version of a perfectionist because then you're diving into this I just want balance I just want balance well you're not a scale <laughs> you're not 
It's not going to happen. Even Librans out there who I know y'all love your scales. I know you do. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be that scale. Uh-huh. I'm like, you're not. It doesn't happen. Harmony happens. And if you can come to the place of harmony where, okay, some days we're going to have more of this than this, but then it's going to, that's where you find balance. Mm -hmm. so, but it's really about living in harmony. It's about allowing for the noisy spaces, for the, for it to be a little chaotic for a minute. And that really comes from working with kids and families when I do. Because I'm sorry. I know every dad and mom, they all want peace. Can we mm -hmm. just have peace in the home? Can we have peace? And I'm like, mm -hmm. kids don't learn through that. Kids don't live that way. They come into this world. The birthing process is not peaceful, people. It is not. I don't care how many lights you and candle, you dim the lights, you put up the candle, you have all the music, you breathe through it, you got the birthing, whatever. Dolphins around you, whatever. It's not peaceful. Not for the, the life coming through, not for, it's just not. It is a moment of, there's a moment of chaos there. There's a moment of joy. There's a moment of letting go. There's a moment of grief because your womb has carried this child for, you know, an extended period of time. And all of a sudden they're exiting into the world. And now your heart went from, your double heart went from being here to outside of you. You have to grieve that. And be in a joyful place at the same time you got this new life and they're going to do all these things and then you have to grieve the expectations that you may have I mean I named my daughter one way because I thought you know when she was born that my daughter is transgender and when she was born we named her one way because I envisioned her name being I come from a football family just chanted when she ran on the football field. And as a young parent, you know, you, you do have, you're very naive about those things. You're also very egocentric mm -hmm. about it. Um, but when she was out and I realized here's this beautiful life. And as she started developing her own personality and if you pay attention babies have personalities right away yeah. but as she started developing and growing I was like oh yeah we're not chanting it's not going to matter how many boy toys how many you know all the things little trucks and we can buy motorcycles and all that stuff that's never going to be who she wants to be mm -hmm. And so, you know, I had to grieve that image for a minute. And for me, it was a minute. I do have friends who have transgender kids that, you know, it doesn't happen for them until way later. And they're like, what do I do? I have to grieve this whole child now. And what do I, you know, but there's always going to be grief and then there's going to be joy in the moment that your child comes to you and says, this is me. And if you can sit in that moment, then it's real easy to move and get over yourself. Because sometimes grief is tied to your ego mm -hmm. and it's not true grief. It's just your own selfish shit that whatever you thought you were going to live through another person or relationship or So yeah, that's what all that means. <laughs> the, lo the long, short version is that's what all that means. <laughs> Again, my piece of paper is full of notes and drawings um, of things that came up 
throughout that answer that really resonated deep with me. Some are um, connections that we both share. Um, Christine, uh, Michelle being one of them. And uh, it, yesterday or maybe day before, I felt very drawn to a short that I had made from our podcast episode where she was talking about birth trauma. And so as soon as you said it, you know, I, I could see her, I could hear those words again in that conversation. Um, grieving the expectation. Um, Liliana um, helped me through what I needed to grieve um, in the boundaries that I set. And understanding that in that term, you know, um, and then harmony versus balance. Um, I had the pleasure of interviewing. Um, she was one of my coaches while I was getting certified to be a health and life coach. Her name is Tracy. So she's on the podcast as well. And she, you know, really explained the difference between balance and harmony. And so like, I take a piece out of every single one of my guests and I, and I put it in my, my little box of beautiful thoughts and new experiences and new, oh, oh. <laughs> I have little pictures and little heart. <laughs> She's, see, and that's another thing when you're authentic, right? Like do you remember being in school and, you know, you note taking and they had you, I mean, now I don't know how it is now, but when we were kids, note taking was very like, you had a structured way and you had to write it this way and you had to write them this way. And all you wanted to do was sit there and doodle and do things. And when you would do that, they, no, that's not how you do that. Why are you doing it that way? Don't do it that way. All of those things almost beat the authenticity out of you. But the thing is, is your soul is not going to allow that to happen. And so once you, you come into, I say, once you get your body part way, I'm a swimmer. So once you get your body off of the first step of the pool, and you know, your legs are in there and it's like, you could turn back, but mm, that water's starting to feel good. It's not. Why would you turn back? Mm. And I do, I have done an exercise with some people that does involve swimming pools. That's really about, you know, showing them. I'll kind of skim the pool a little bit. And that's a thing for me to clear that sacred space. And then when they're in it and as they're getting in, I have them experience every step that they get in instead of just diving in. Mm -hmm. um, and really being aware of what's in the pool and what's, and I'm like, this is your life. Take the swimming pool as your life. And now you've got leaves floating over here. You got some bugs over there. You got, but what, what are you focusing on? And so I'll go through it with them and I'm like, push it away. Either push it behind you, throw it out of the pool. But if you want to get to that other side and the goal is to get to the other side, and enjoy that swim, you're going to have to get rid of some of this crap. And is it really in your way? Or are you drawing it to you? Because sometimes when you're in there, if you panic, you draw stuff to you. And yeah, that one's usually a pretty hard, you know, exercise to go through with people. But it's definitely eye-opening. And it's something I used to do for myself as a kid. 
It was how I processed the day because my grandparents had a pool and my grandmother didn't swim. I started swimming at three months old. So water has always been my safe haven and swimming has. And I was taught how to skim the pool at an early age and realizing, you know, when I get in there, my grandmother would tell me, did you have, she'd ask me if I had a bad day at daycare or preschool or school. And I'd say, yeah. Or if I was fighting with my cousins during the summer, because they're all, I had one older and the rest were all younger. And if we weren't getting along that day, she'd let me go out to the pool and swim and tell me, go swim it off. And I didn't realize until I started really being mindful with that action when I go visit my father in Phoenix. And his pool's always clean for the most part. I mean, it's Phoenix. It's just what you do. It's whole cycle system and everything. But I go swim at midnight out there because nobody was out there. Mm -hmm. And it was all to myself. And I would chase the reflection of the moon in the pool and kind of get these little messages at that point. But then again, I wasn't really connected with myself enough to take it all in. It wasn't until I got real with myself that I realized, oh, that's what I was doing. That's what I've been doing my whole life. That's what I've been, that's why I crave having a swimming pool. That's why I like going into the ocean. That's why, I, you know, is looking at all those pieces and you have this big body of water around you and you're really insignificant all of a sudden. And yet you wanna, all I wanna do is play and swim and be free in that space. And I can be, I have to clear the shit out of my way because <laughs> I don't want it on my hair. I don't want it in my, you know? And so it's like, oh, and sometimes it's just as simple as that, as just clearing it out of your way, but we make it harder than it has to be. Hmm. Hmm. To give the, the pool thing a thought. I do want to talk to you about two of your gifts in particular um, and how you use them to help provide clarity and connection for others. Dream walking and astral travel. Oof, oof. So some of us who are healers, light workers, spiritual um teachers, guides, advisors, what have you. Some of us live more in one realm than the 3D here. Mm -hmm. um, astral travel, how I help people with that is I don't have to, some people have to go through a process. They have to meditate. They have to do things in order to do that. I can do it pretty quickly. And so through that, I can see what people's gifts are. I can see what, um, it's real easy access to blocks, like on that spiritual past life side or why you keep calling this in, in this lifetime. Um, more so about finding your strengths. I usually go for the, because I'm like, I know plenty of people who can read your past life and they are amazing at it. And there is stuff there that, you know, you can cut cords, all those things. There are some people though, like for me, I can't cut cords. Like my, whatever my purpose is, whatever my soul, my essence is, cutting cords in this lifetime is not allowed. And people have tried to do it on me. I've tried to do it. It doesn't, it's like a tapestry. And if you cut one, the whole thing unravels. 
So <clears throat> it's really about, but what you can do is on a tapestry, you know, you can singe an end to finish that part of the piece. Mm -hmm. So I can burn it, but I can't cut it. Um, and some people don't know that about themselves. So they go to all these practitioners and healers and they're like, oh, we can cut cords. Let's just cut the cord. Let's cut the cord. And yet it's not cut. Well, sometimes you've got, that's not what it is. Um, so I can see those things, but I also see your strength and I can help pull that back in and help figure out where it aligned in your life at one point that you need it now. So that instead of recognizing the trauma constantly that you went through, it was like, okay, where was the lesson? What was it you were supposed to learn? Um, <clears throat> you know, because focusing on the trauma keeps you bitter and resentful and it blinds mm -hmm. you from the gratitude, from the, your own grace, from seeing your own grace, your own. And you may, even in that moment, you may still see your resilience, but you may become bitter and resentful about that. Mm -hmm. So it's about, okay, your resilience is supposed to show you that you can get through it, that you can rise above, that you've learned the lesson. That's what that's there for. It's not really about you get back up and you get knocked down and you get back up and you get knocked down. No, you're not the bozo, the clown thing that we had as kids that you keep punching over. That's not what you are. It's your resilience is your ability, it's almost kind of like <clears throat> your IQ score on a soul level. It's how many times did you connect with your, your intuition? How many times did you love yourself in that moment? Because you, you're not resilient without, you don't have self-preservation and that resilience without loving yourself. You may not see it. You may not know how to feel it. You may not know how to even recognize it or connect with it, but it's there. So on that astral travel side, I can see things. I can go places, other places and um, pull in many strengths and look at so that I can ask those questions. I can reflect, well, what about this? Can you feel that in your body? Can you feel the moment <clears throat> that you got up? Can you see, I can see when you stood outside of yourself in that moment and helped yourself get up. Um, the dream walking, that one there. So that's kind of come into play here recently um, because a lot of people, there's astral travel, there's <clears throat> spirit walking, there's dream walking, there's time walking, there's out of body experience, there's, and Unless you've done them, you don't realize. So they get lumped into one. And they're not. They are separate. Like, they're very different things. Um, the dream walking. So a lot of times I get called into people's dreams to help them and it's not my dream it's somebody else's I know exactly you know I know what's my dreams and what someone else's I know when I get called into spaces lately I've also been able to recognize and work with people who you know they're exhausted they're not they feel like they haven't slept they don't understand their dreams they don't like they don't know anybody in those dreams. Like who the hell are all these people? 
There is nobody <laughs> familiar in that space. And I don't even know what's going on here, but there's some kind of conflict. There's some kind of something going on. And I don't know what the hell this is. I don't recognize anybody. <laughs> or you may recognize one person in there and you're like, and it's all their people. And you're like, how did I get sucked into that? I never even met these people. Mm -hmm. You're most likely dream walking. And because you have these connections with people, they yank you in there. So then you're working on a spiritual level all night. And then on a subconscious level all night. So you're not sleeping. You're not getting enough rest. Your body's not even fully resting because there's a part of your brain that is like trying to still process what you're seeing on mm -hmm. that spiritual side of things, on that dream state side, like what the, and that will put you in overload, mm -hmm. especially if you've been pulled in several different directions. And sometimes you don't always know you have. Um, but yeah, then that's when you usually get like this weird mix of stuff that you're like, I still don't know anybody and I don't even know this place and I don't even know what, what is this? But if you go back through and if you have the one person that sticks out and sometimes they don't always like someone called me into a dream. I thought it was an adult because all I could see and feel and hear. And that's the other thing is a lot of dream walkers. You dream in color. You taste things in your dreams. You smell them in your dreams. Those aren't all normal. Those aren't all normal dream state things that people do. Most people dream in black and white. Um, they don't taste. They don't fully hear or remember hearing. They don't have sense. They don't have, like, your senses aren't active mm -hmm. in those spaces. So as a dream walker, your senses are active because you're supposed to be helping this person to figure this out or heal, or even you may be needing to learn something there. Um, but yeah, I got called into one that I was like, who the hell is that? You know, I'm looking around. And for me, I can be in the person that's dreaming space so I can see what they're seeing. My space as an observer. And then if there's some kind of other yucky thing happening, like let's say there's a... a predator and a victim I can be in all those spaces hmm. at once and it's gross and I don't like it I also know there's a reason why because I can help people kind of it puts me in a different empathetic space for those people to work with those people so that they don't feel alone because sometimes that's all you really need to start the healing process is to not feel alone mm -hmm. To have someone understand, oh my God, that is exactly what I felt. And I wasn't wrong because I froze or because I didn't do what everybody told me I should have done or, you know, and it's like, no, your body was literally paralyzed. You, there wouldn't have been anything you could have done. You're good. Like now it's really about moving through that. Um, but yeah, I got called into a dream that I didn't even realize until I talked to another dream walker and they were like, sounds like a kid. And I'm like, oh crap. Oh crap. And I started like, oh, that's why that looked like that. Okay. That makes sense now. That's why that looked like that because they were the little. It was a child's mind. It wasn't one of my adult friends or adult acquaintances or, you know, 
that it called me in, it was somebody's kid. And I'm like, oh, okay. All right. Okay, buddy. I see you. I got you. It's all right. We can, and now I can help bridge that gap for them on this side in the waking world and like, okay, so what was going on there? What, and you can call me in again and I will help with that however I can because there was some, yeah, stuff in that. I guess there was two very distinct reasons why I asked for those two in particular. Um, the dream walking, you know, as I, you know, text you in my, what the fuck? <laughs> mm -hmm. like, why? And it seems <clears throat> to be, and again, we talked about my dark circles before we started recording. I'm like, why are they so intense right now? I mean, I'm sleeping probably seven to nine hours. But in that, I feel like I'm dreaming that entire seven to nine hours. And I wake up just, what the hell? Why am I on overload? Why is my mind, why are these people coming up? What the hell's going on? But like you said, I'm dreaming in full color, full sound, taste, smell. Um, and that's been really crazy because sometimes I do remember specifically dreaming in black and white. And usually it's um, like a busy street, lots of houses and buildings and a long street or road ahead of me. That is black and white. What I've been doing lately, and this has been every night, probably for about a week and a half, um, where it's very much in color. It's people that I know that have been in my life, um, but I'm like, why is this person coming to me now? What is the connection? Why? And I'm just like, man, I just, I'm so tired. <laughs> I'm like, help, Nikki, what the hell? <laughs> Why am I processing all this now? Hi. I told you. <clears throat> I told you, you were going to get cracked open here, that you were going to open up after that, mm -hmm. that group. And and that's the other thing too, is I can be here and just be supportive in that space and like, okay, you're not going crazy. And here are some things you can do at night or before bed to help to block that. It can help you to start to build doors and things so that you're like, nope. Like when an ex calls you into a dream, those are always fun. Because you're like, who are the hell are all these people? I don't like any of them. Why are they all here? You know, or you don't even know who. But it becomes very obvious that it's the ex calling you in. Mm -hmm. Because all of a sudden you're saying and doing things in that dream that you would never say or do. But they're all things that they wanted you to say or do at some point. Like you become a puppet. You have this very puppet-like marionette feeling. Mm -hmm. And so as a dream walker, something you can do is like, oh, no, 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 no. We're not doing that. Bye-bye. This is not mine. You can stop now. Thank you. And sometimes that's just to help you guys cut the cord or you reaffirm a boundary. Because sometimes dream walking is for us too. You know, it's like it gives you a little bit of, hey, this person's kind of manifesting some stuff around you. And you can't really stop them in this space over here. But over here, you can start to block off things so that they can't keep accessing all of your energy and all of your space. And that especially happens with exes, with family members, with anyone that we have like an automatic energetic like link to. 
that just gets so intertwined because it gets intertwined with other things and it gets, hmm. and that's why I say some people can't cut cords because they're so intertwined and wrapped within this one and that one that you're going to have to look for a micro thread to cut it. Like it, it's, and even then you may not be able to. Good to know. Good to know. <laughs> oh, I'm like, we, we will definitely explore your, your dreams a little more, but yeah, there are things that you can do. You can set, you can ask your guides, look, I need sleep tonight. I get it. I have this part of my purpose. And for some dream walkers, especially if you're like a coach, if you're some kind of providing some kind of active service to people in this world, right? Mm -hmm. And helping them to heal and work through things. Then it's almost like those experiences are like sometimes they interplay where over here it can be training day for over there and over there it can be training day for over here so that you can help them work through something or something comes up with a, a client and you're like oh yeah I saw that in this person's dream over here which reminds me I should have you know connect with them about that but it helps give you some guidance as how to work with this person that may seem impossible at first or like why are you in my what is this what is what's going on here because I get that sometimes I'm like why 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 I don't even know why and at first I would be like that no why and then I realized oh well it's because I have this over here mm -hmm. that they need over here. So sometimes it, it helps with that, but you can ask your guys, you can tell them, look, I need a night off. We need to put up some doors. I need my own dreams for a while. I need sleep. My body needs sleep. My brain needs sleep. And the thing about dream walking is, is that it is always very concrete real life things you're not going to another planet another realm another um you're not multi-dimensional traveling you're not doing any of that it's all very like oh you know it's not like Dreamwalking is like, for comic book geeks out there, it's like DC versus Spider-Man or DC versus Marvel. Sorry. Oh, <laughs> hurt myself. Hurt myself. But you know, you have one set that has very real cities and one that doesn't. Mm -hmm. Very cosmic, has, very outer worldly. Mm-hmm. And, you know, Gotham's not a city. Like, Spider-Man lives in New York. Batman lives in Gotham. Gotham is not. Hmm. So that's like, so that would be dream walking versus multi-dimensional. You're going to other other universes, other lifetime things. So it still looks a little real enough, but there's a little fantasy element to it on the multidimensional side, whereas the dreamwalk side, it's all very subconscious, real crap. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it doesn't seem believable if you... I don't ever want anyone to be called into those because I've seen things that I don't want to see um, that are very real. 
And so when I tell people I have seen the worst of humanity, I've seen the worst of humanity and felt it, tasted it, smelled it on all the sides and it's gross and not fun, but that it's still very, somebody is living that now. Somebody is going to live that now. Now you can have premonitions in, in the dreams too while you're dream walking. And you can have, you know, premonitions without the dream walk. Where you, you see future things playing out. But they're even more realistic to a dream walker. The, the argument, the like, so that when it actually happens on this side of things, you're like, oh shit, this is deja vu. Well, no, it's not. It You just got the 411 ahead of time that this is exactly how it's going to go down and this is exactly what it's going to look like. Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> I'm going to step back to the astral travel side. Um, again, the, you know, the purpose of these podcasts is to provide people alternatives, options, information, um, stuff that we're not aware of that are available to us in our time of need, in our time when we're seeking answers in, you know, whether it's our physical health, our mental health, our spiritual health, um, you talked about um, accessing blocks, repeating patterns, finding your strength, um, but you talked about resilience and resentment and those clouds that kind of keep you from having that resilience, feeling that reason, remembering you have it. Mm -hmm. Thus the name of my business. When I was drowning in my trauma soup, my resilience was something I couldn't see. And I couldn't understand because what was causing me trauma was from 25 years prior. And then I felt like I had resilience because I didn't have an option, but to have resilience, I had to get up. I had to get dressed. I had to go to work. I had to cook for my kids. I had to, I had to, I had to. So I never had, you know, the ability to not have resilience at that time. But now 25 years later, I'm in a situation where I am literally reliving every day like it was 25 years prior. I didn't know that was a thing. I didn't know our bodies hung on to those things for dear life until I was living it, I was feeling it. And I kept trying to verbalize, this is what you're causing me to feel and go through and remember. And I don't want to remember that shit. I want to put it back in the fucking box and move on. And I remember having, you know, that was my initial conversation with my therapist was like, I just want you to tell me how to put this shit back in Pandora's box. It's out, it's loose, it's dark, it's ugly, it's got nails. I don't like it. I want to put it back and I want to move on. And she giggled out loud. <laughs> and I thought, you bitch. Huh? But, you know, but it was like, if I had had knowledge, access to someone like you who could help me through those things to see those things to see the lessons to see what I was missing to help me get out of the resentment because that resentment was something I carried for probably a year and a half two years in the recent past like I carried the resentment for the person who made me relive that shit and it was, it was all attached to trauma, but I was so thick in it that I couldn't verbalize it. I couldn't explain it to anybody else in terms that they could understand it. 
It was just like, well, I don't know. It's just this. It's just that. It's just, just move on. Just get past it. And I'm like, again, I go back to those memories of early childhood where we're taught how to just get past it. Just deal with it. Just put a smile on your face and show up. Um, so, you know, having you talk through these things, having the ability for me now to share you and your gifts with somebody else, if I can save them half the time, quarter of the time, a third of the pain, then this is why I'm doing what I'm doing. So thank you, Nikki. <laughs> You're welcome. You're so welcome. Uh, I, you know, that's how I, the day that I told one of my therapists, I said, I am grateful. And this could trigger some people. So a little trigger warning here. Um, I am a rape survivor, not just a survivor. I'm a thriver. And some people are like, oh, that's very egocentric. And I'm like, no, it's for me because mm -hmm. my healing is about me. And I survived the minute that I walked out of that room. That was survived. When I told a therapist one time, when I finally came into the, the resilience piece and recognizing that self-love and everything, said, I'm grateful. I'm grateful for that experience. And she was like, <laughs> because we were working on my list of gratitude and I said, I'm grateful for it because one, I don't know a woman on this planet who hasn't experienced some kind of sexual assault. And I know a whole lot of men who have too. And I had to develop great empathy around that. Not just for others, but for myself. And it wasn't, you know, sympathy, which it's so funny because some people are like, oh, but don't you know, sympathy is bypassing. Mm -hmm. um, empathy is a whole nother ball game. And I get frustrated with people who are like, oh, empaths, blah, blah, blah. They're empaths. And I'm like, do you know how amazing an empath is? That they feel everything on whatever level it is they feel so much and they're still standing but the more you sit there and oh an empath they're mm -hmm. weak they're blah 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 they're there for you know everything that's coming out right now with like narcissists and toxic and blah 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 and I'm like no an empath is there so that when trauma happens they may have experienced it firsthand and they can sit with you in that dark space for a minute. Do they stay there with you? No, they're not meant to stay there with you and they're not meant to heal you, mm -hmm. but they're there because humans are a collective being. They are an animal that needs each other. You, even, you know, most introverts and lone wolves still need somebody whether it be one human connection and it's through, you know, video or writing or whatever, you still need that. You need it for your own sanity. It's just the way that humans are programmed and, you know, made for lack of a better term. It's, it's in your DNA. It's the way you're encoded. It's, um, but yeah, that, 
having empathy. And so being grateful for that experience helped to take the resentment away from my resilience and really embrace my resilience around that. Not get it confused, not get it, um, not get it caught in the, oh, but you're so strong and you're so, sometimes the worst compliment you can give somebody is, oh, you're so strong that you lived through that. And my mom used to tell me when I was younger, because the world was so overwhelming for me, that I, I was suicidal a lot. I just, I couldn't, I couldn't handle anymore. And, you know, when you have parents who have their own trauma and their own stuff, and they're a mess, kind of, or a lot of mess. It's overwhelming and it's a lot and you just don't want to be here. Especially if you can see the other side, you're like, I know what that looks like over there. The grass is greener over there in a way, but that's not what we're here for. We signed up to live and I'm like, live, living life. That's what, and you get to live it on your terms, but you got to be in alignment with that, and that resentment and resilience. When you get those two kind of intertwined and confused and a mess, it'll block you from that. And sometimes that's the only block you really have is that you're so hell bent on being angry about everything that happened. And your refusal to see, what did I learn? What did I experience? What did I, how did I grow there? Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying it's a cakewalk because look. No, it is not. I, I've had the, the cheating husband. I've had the, you know, that I thought would be forever. And that was my person and blah, blah, blah. And all of the things. And I've had the sexual assault. I've had domestic violence, like all of those horrible things in life and bankruptcies and all the things, right? And I was, I was resentful as shit to the point that it, your resentment pushes the people away that can help you reflect your light and help you really shine in the world. True. If you're sitting true, around, true, true. Yeah. Right. Like if you're sitting around and I got this because I had seen a podcast or something and this, this, the speaker was saying, maybe it was a Ted talk and he was saying, you know, I don't say I'm tired anymore. I say I'm in need of rest because when you sit around and you tell all your friends and your family, you're tired, I'm tired. I'm tired. Well, you're, you're reinforcing that for yourself. One. So you're programming your brain to always think you're tired mm -hmm. and your body and your family and friends. Well, nobody's going to ask you if you're tired all the time. I mean, think about it. How many times are you going to tell some, someone, a friend's going to tell you, I'm tired, I'm tired, I'm tired. And you suggest the things and you let's do this. Let's do that to where you stop asking, True. you stop asking. And then the next thing you know, you're getting the call, right? You're a bad friend. Why didn't you ask me to go? Well, cause you're always tired. We go and you sit there and you're telling everybody you're tired. So why are we gonna ask you? Clearly you need sleep, you need something. Mm-hmm. Whereas when you say you're in need of rest, that's a momentary thing. I love it. So it's the same thing. Like you just, sometimes it's really the wording too that we get caught up in and we block ourselves with. 
but yeah, the resentment and resilience thing, sometimes that gets real confusing because you can, well, I got back up. Well, okay, you're pissed off about it. Instead of celebrating the fact that, fuck, you got back up. Damn, let's celebrate that. Sometimes, yes, everybody needs a fucking trophy and ribbon for that. Look, I'm a Gen Xer. No, we don't all need them. We need them for our unique, special things that we do and how we show up in the world. Mm -hmm. Everybody deserves that. But the getting back up one, celebrate that instead of, oh, I had to get back up again. Well, shit, you were able to do it. And is it getting easier each time? Now, maybe stop for a minute and look at what you learned. Did you learn anything every time you got back up? Because here's the other part. You're going to keep getting that shit if you don't figure yep. out what you learned every time. And it really, for me, it took, like you said, it took celebrating the lesson learned, celebrating the win on the other side of that resentment to get past the resentment because I carried it for a long time. It was very dark. It was very heavy. It was something I focused on in my story was this resentment, this resentment, this resentment, and just being so angry all the time uh, that when I did come through it, when I did get back to my resilience, when I did overcome it, I was able to celebrate the lesson and the opportunity that it provided me. Had that not happened, I honestly don't think I would be sitting right here today because it was that thing, that trauma, that experience that opened the door for me to quit my career that was not serving me the way I believed that it would, because I always believed that leaving accounting and being in a very just numbers alone career, moving into legal, I fully believed that I was going to be able to be in service to others. I was going to be able to help people. But the longer I was in it, the more I realized I wasn't helping the people that I wanted to help. And it wasn't providing me what I needed to fill my cup. It was just draining and draining and draining and draining. And so when I stopped long enough to listen to that, to celebrate that win and to pay attention to the opportunity that it provided me, that I was able to let go of the resentment and to truly celebrate where I am versus the anger, the resentment, the, you know, just, it's like night and day. It, it, I'm able to share that story without the focus on the negative. I'm able to share that story from a healed place inside of me. Yep. And sometimes the lesson is just, it's a pre, again, it's like, you know, it's a warm up. Stuff that we experience in our childhood that like our parents did or whatever. It's almost like, it's a warm up so that we know that when the time comes, we have the tools and the ability, we don't realize it at the time, but to get up, to walk away, to say enough is enough. Because if you can connect with the little kid in you who witnessed some things, little kids are super honest and intuitive and, you know, they speak a truth that is damn near fact. And people don't really give them enough credit. But if you think back, you know, there's stuff that I look at that my parents said, I'm all, that was stupid. But I replayed that shit. 
Mm -hmm. Because somewhere you get so caught up in that. Well, no, you just got to grow up because everybody wants you to grow up because you just need to grow up and you need to. And I was doing that with my kids until one day they were like, I was telling them a story of some dumb shit that me and my friends did when we were in high school. And they were like, yeah, you were really dumb. And sitting there and going, oh, yeah, that was really dumb. My kids haven't done that. <laughs> so I'm like, every time those things come in, I'm like, okay, we're, we're breaking some, some things. Okay. You know, even if they're little things, but that resilience, you have to be able to celebrate it and not tie it not keep tying it to your trauma mm -hmm. and allow it to show up in other areas. You know, you, you get lectured at work that day. Yeah, you got in trouble at school when you were a kid. You had that one person, that early job, that whatever. You came back from it, you got another job. You, looking at that okay so what did I sometimes it is just learning or the lesson is just you came back from it and that's enough but oh no I don't know some people but yeah that's what I do <laughs> that's what I do I love it so what are we're going to try to start wrapping this up um, what are some practical steps that listeners can incorporate into their daily lives to help cultivate more authenticity, joy, and harmony? I love how you, you know, really explain getting into your core values. And I'm really looking forward to you and I sitting together and truly planning um, um, how to help people. But what are some just practical steps that you can throw out to help people between now and then? Um, you know, one thing is I like affirmations, but here's the problem. You've got to believe them, right? And if you aren't connected with yourself enough, you're not going to believe them. You're just going to keep saying them over and over and they're going to become irritating and again, something you resent. Mm -hmm. So something that I say is look for three moments in life that you define as joyful. Three. And a lot of people, you know, have gone through a lot of trauma or they're in that resentment. I don't have any. I don't. I don't care if it is the day that you were in little league and you hit the ball and that's all you did. Like you didn't get the home run, but you hit the ball. Finally, you connected bat to ball. In that moment, you felt that joy. You felt accomplished. You felt successful because you finally did that. If it was, you know, you went like, stop overthinking the joy piece. It doesn't have to be some grand moment that has to come with a huge label. A lot of people put their success and their accomplishments and their joy based on a timeline, based on benchmarks of, did we get married? Did I have kids? Did I get that job? Did I have that career? Did I advance when I wanted to? Did I stop asking the did I's and ask, just look for a minute, sit in, just sit for a minute. My grandma used to tell me that when I get all worked up. She had me sit in her bed of viruses and she'd say, just sit for a minute. So find your place where you can recognize harmony. That's another one. Whether it be, you know, you go for walks or you're cleaning your house or you sit outside in your backyard or you look at, you know, 
pictures online. Define what harmony is for you. What does it mean to you? Those, those three moments of joy, like try to find the harmony that was in those three moments of joy too. That's the next part of that. But first, get your three moments of joy. Every day, list five things you're grateful for. And here's the thing about that one. You can be grateful for future stuff too. Mm. I have pages of before I became a published author that say I'm grateful for being a best-selling author. I have that. I'm grateful for, you know, some days my grateful is I'm grateful that I have a soft comforter on my bed. I'm always grateful for my kids. Um, that's a, a top one. I'm always grateful for my gifts. But start to build on it. See how many you can get. Play a game with yourself. How many things can you be grateful for? I'm grateful that the spoons are in the right part of the tray in the thing in the drawer. Like sometimes you have to go that simple and go that it's all right. I'm grateful I didn't stub my damn toe earlier. Like, it's okay to think outside the box. It's okay to think of something future. It's okay to, because when, especially a lot of trauma, I realized recently this came up within this last week and someone said something to me that was very profound. What happened in various relationships for me and then in this last one that was very big and significant in my life is that they little by little killed my hope. They, they strengthened the shit out of my resilience. Made me determined, made me, but my hope because this one gave me hope in spaces. And when you have something come in and take away your hope or block it or blind it or bury it or whatever, that is a hard thing to come back from. It is. And thank God I have a friend who's a hope coach who I didn't even realize, you know, here this person came into my life and is a ray of sunshine and I just love her for everything that she does and she is and who she is and and how she moves in the world and how she's kind of let me peek behind the the hope veil right behind the curtain yeah behind the curtain there and it just when someone said that to me this week, I was like, oh shit. I, that is something that I will fiercely fight for and probably add to now my, my, the way I live is that there is hope there. And some people are like, hope is a negative vibration. Hope is a blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, okay, because it keeps you in a lack and it keeps you in a wanting. And there's a different kind of hope. Mm -hmm. There's a different kind of hope. There's a, a knowing hope, a, a belief, mm -hmm. a faith around that. And so I'm like, oh, okay. So if you've lost your hope, then definitely that's something you want to start to where do you dream? Where do you yeah. stop limiting yourself? And yes, there is systemic stuff. There's stuff that is going to get in that way, in your way. But if you're sitting around looking at someone who grew up in the same neighborhood as you, 
who grew up in almost the same family or whatever, and why do they get to have, and why do they get to do, and why did, and how, and how, and how. And they may have even had less than you and had just as many struggles and just as many obstacles. And why did they get all that? Why? Why? Why can't I? I did this, this, and this. Why can't I? Well, sometimes some shit's not meant for you, one. And two, what did they do? Was it just the fact that they were in touch with their resilience? Was it just the fact they were in touch with their authenticity somewhere? That they were living their core beliefs? Because a lot of times we want stuff that doesn't align with our core beliefs. And that's why you don't get it. That's why it doesn't last. That's why it doesn't stay. That's why that person doesn't stick around. That's why that relationship doesn't work. That's why that job didn't work. That's why it was just a job. That's why you just go to work. That's why you didn't go on that vacation. That, because it didn't align with you. And it's okay. Some shit's not meant for you. That's why we're all different. Because we all bring something different to the table. If you just had a cake that was just flour, yep. you don't have anything. You just got flour. Like, so yeah. You need all those other pieces. So find those things that are you. Start to identify another thing. Last one, last one. The stuff that people say is weird about you or, and weird and like, not creepy weird, okay, but weird. Like you're just kind of, they do the little, hi, that's so weird, you know, and it's not a, like they're trying to get away from you because you're creeping them out weird, mm -hmm. but it's that where it's just kind of that odd thing in the group, like you're in the friend group and it's that one odd thing. It's that quirk that you have. Dive into that quirk. Own it. Your shit is you like to wear Chuck Taylors and you're 50 years old and you don't, I wear fucking overalls all the time because I love them. And I own that because it's part of me. Sometimes look at your clothes. How are you dressing? How's your, is your room your sanctuary? Is your space your sanctuary? You know, all of those things. That's all stuff I go into too. But look at the stuff that where people come in, they're like, wow, I didn't think that you'd have that. Or I didn't think the stuff that stands out to people mm -hmm. that they're surprised by with you that isn't like a negative, like, oh, wow, I didn't realize you were an abusive ass. Like, no, more al along the lines of like, when people walk in my home, they're like, oh, wow, you really like that. Or, oh, wow, dive into that. Why do you like that so much? Because somewhere you're going to find yourself in there and you may find your joy in there. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> as we have gotten to further know each other um yeah. i have had the pleasure of owning my weird like just own it because that's where your your special sauce is that's where the stuff is the good stuff where you're gonna bring that into the world and somebody's gonna look at that and go wow mm -hmm. that's amazing wow i'm in awe of you wow Stop settling for shit that you shouldn't settle for. I don't know who told you to do that and said that that's how you're grateful, but it's not. Settling doesn't make you humble. Settling doesn't finding yourself. Bringing something into the world that you were meant to bring into the world. That is the secret sauce. Yep. That's the stuff. <laughs> and it's funny. Um, I, I, you know, that was one thing I kind of focused on this week, not necessarily my weird, 
but that five things, that 10 things, you know, I just, I see so many people who are wrapped in the negative, like they just wallow in their misery and they bathe in it. And it's like, you know, I'm so tired of tired of seeing this negative. So I choose what I see and don't see because that helps me. But so I tried to flip it. I'm like, instead of putting all your focus on what sucks in your life, let's throw out 10 things that, that you are just grateful for 10 things that are just so miraculous in your life that you want to celebrate. And it was even hard for me to come up with 10. I had to sit in it. I know all my blessings. I feel them, but to be able to define them to, yeah, just really put focus on what that was changed my perspective. It was like, oh, okay. I hadn't thought about that. Um, but yeah, I am absolutely grateful for that. And it was a simple thing like the internet. The world is at my fingertips. Where were we when we were kids? If we wanted information, it was go to the library, go through the card stock, you know, oh, we didn't yeah. have this abundance of information, this abundance of opportunity, taking time to, instead of saying, oh, somebody else is already doing this or somebody else, somebody, you know, everybody else is already coaching who the world doesn't need another coach. The world needs me. Because my story, my experience, plus my education make me who I am. And the world is never going to have another me. There's only one me. Mm -hmm. And so just stopping and actually, you know, thank you, Nikki, pen to paper. Um, I had to sit down and write that list before I typed it up as a post. I had to think about it. I had to live into it. I had to sit into it. Um, and you reminded me, you know, my my convincing myself that I can't journal. Um, you remind me that, that, yeah, I can. And yeah, I do. I just, not in the definition mm -hmm. of how people say you're expected to journal. Um, mine is very much, you know, yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's, this. it's in the margins. It's drawing pictures. It's feeling my feels. Um, and not just words or not just a prompt that I have to think about. I can just let it come. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Another, you know, sometimes those just letting it come and letting it flow are your guides coming through are your people coming through are your past lives coming through with that strength message like hey we're here your higher self coming through and saying let's let's love ourselves your inner child coming through and saying i mean when you can integrate your inner children and there's more than one just saying i i yeah, when you can integrate your spirit child and your 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 spirit children and your inner children back together, that feeling is like then when you do stuff to feed that, like right now, you know, I I work at a place that she's got it's an oddity store and she's got this basket of stickers. And the joke is is because for like weeks I go in and buy stickers, you know, while I was at work. And yesterday I was like, I'm not buying any stickers. The kids said I can't buy any stickers today. <laughs> so I was picking out my stickers that I was going to buy next week because nobody said about next week yet. And I buried <laughs> them. The ones that I want, I buried them in the pile. I'm like, so, you know, if someone buys them, then they buy them. And they, I wasn't meant to get them. Mm -hmm. They're still there waiting for me. Then they're mine, right? 
I got this blanket that someone made me. And the minute I held it and wrapped it around me, all of me was like, oh, so happy. And it was all mine. And it was this, like, not a care in the world. And I was like, all of me is happy. I like that. And sometimes it's as simple as that. Sometimes it's just taking a shower. Sometimes it's, I think we overcomplicate things. And we live by other people's definitions of how our life should look. And we're all unique. We're all, that's why we all have our own. Our eyes don't look the same. Our fingerprints don't look the same. We're all, I'm going to probably irritate some people. You are, you're like a raindrop. You're like a snowflake. No one is the same. Mm -hmm. You may look like somebody. You may have similar features. You may even be an identical twin, but still you're not the same. You were meant to bring something else into the world. And there's only one you. So bring you. Stop trying to be everybody else because they're already taken. I I hate that term. Imitation is form of flattery. I hate no. that. I'm like, no, it's not. If anything, it's irritating. And it's not irritating in the way, to me, it's not irritating in the way people think it is. It's irritating because I'm like, you're so far away from yourself that you're trying to be something that you can't be and they get it. And that makes me sad for you. Yeah. <laughs> I agree. I agree. Like it, So I, let's yeah. close this up. Let's, yep. let's, uh, Tell people where they can find you because that is the that is the gold at the end of this beautiful conversation is where can people find you? So they can find me on Facebook um, at the Connected Compass page or you can find me Nicole Nikki Bruton Phillips on Facebook. You can find me on Instagram. Um, I think it's God, I can't ever remember my Instagram. Connected Compass has an Instagram, so you can always DM me there. Um, you can find me on TikTok. You can definitely my website, uh, www.yourconnectedcompass.com. Um, you can find me at the Crow's Nest every Wednesday up in Santa Fe. If you want to connect in person and live, you can reach out to me. I will soon be at It's a Vibe at 505 here in Albuquerque uh, after the 24th. I'll be there. I believe I'm going to be there Tuesdays and Thursdays and some Saturdays. So you'll be able to find me there. And then, you know, my number 505-226-8353. You can connect with me there as well. I will include all of that in the show notes. One other thing you didn't mention that I will also include. And if you want a quick second to talk about it, Nikki is the co-author of a book, Voices, Book One, Women Braving It All to Live Their Purpose. That is, so that is the first book that I am published in. There will be more to come. Um, and all of the stories in that, that book are an inspiration. All of those women are an inspiration to me. Um, it's, you can purchase it on Amazon, Barnes and Noble. Um, believe there's a Kindle version. I think, um, yeah, so please feel free to purchase. It's, if you're looking for something that's going to inspire you, a lot of great stories, true stories and experiences, and really about resilience and your voice, like your voice is your greatest gift. That's what we all have. 
And if you use it in the right way, it can change not only your life, but others. Absolutely. So thank you, Nikki, so much. It is every time I talk to you, it, it's I learn more, we go deeper. You help me through things that I'm either struggling with or just to recognize um, voice is something um, that was difficult for me. Um, I wish somebody had, you know, nudged me on that uh, growing up that it, we do have a voice and that is our power. Um, so thank you for sharing that. Um, and if you enjoyed this interview, please subscribe to my YouTube channel, Finding Resilience with Leanne. Um, Happiness on Tap podcast is available on YouTube, Spotify, Amazon Music, Audible, iHeartRadio, and all the places you like to find your podcast. For more information from me, you can find me at my website, Finding Resilience with Leanne. I'm glad I was able to share a little bit about what that means to me, what that journey was, um, and how difficult it was to find my resilience and get past resentment and um, how I flourish now that I have gone that path and lived that journey. Um, so thank you, Nikki. I appreciate you. I look forward to seeing you this evening. <laughs> like, thank you. Thank you. I, I always, I love being a guest. I love your podcast. I love what you do, who you are, how you show up in the world. You always, I love this adventure we're on and the learning, the constant, every time something new. I, Absolutely. So thank you, everyone. We'll see you again soon.